Aloha and welcome to Ehana Kako, a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. I'm delighted that today my guest, Michael Lilly, former Attorney General, uh, will be able to shed some light on a, an issue that is often very confusing. What's the relationship between the Hawaiian people and the law today? Uh, as many of you may know, the Grassroot Institute is committed to promoting government transparency and accountability. And we do that with respect to a, a good number of, gov of government departments. One in particular is the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and also the agency known as the Native Hawaiian Role Commission. Uh, Michael Lilly has been part of our team committed to building a more transparent government here in Hawaii. Michael, welcome to the program. Good to be here. Well, you know, with your vast experience as a <laughs> former attorney general and <laughs> Private you practice attorney. <laughs> <laughs> that was a compliment, actually. You. You're wise. <laughs> Good. You know, Michael, not too long ago, earlier this year, you walked into the federal court and you delivered a request for the Native Hawaiian role. And, and I thought we'd take a little bit of time and talk about why we're asking for the list of people who've signed up for, for this. And, of course, the, the role is an attempt by the Native Hawaiian Role Commission to make a, a register of Hawaiians who will hold a constitutional convention, who will elect leaders, and establish a sovereign government. Why are we interested in having that list? Well, first of all, it was in state court. State court, okay. And uh, we're, we're operating under the state law that provides that any state agency um, must make available to the public uh, records that it maintains, documents that it maintains. And why do we do that? Transparency. Transparency, uh, if you want government to be honest and above board, you want it to be transparent and open. Uh, we've learned through bitter history, and it's why we have the open records law, that when government does things behind closed doors, um, they get sweetheart deals, uh, and they do things that are not in the best interest of the public. But someone once said, test what you do by whether you want to see you on the front page of the newspaper. If you don't, it's probably something you don't want to do. So uh, government must be open because it's government mm -hmm. of the people and by the people. Now, there are sometimes questions as to whether or not the Office of Hawaiian Affairs or the Native Hawaiian Role Commission, which is situated there, they fund it to some extent, there's sometimes a question as to whether or not that's actually government. No. Are, are they just no. as, are they government? That's absolutely been established. OHA is a state agency. A state agency. It's established by the state legislature, mm -hmm. and, and the courts have already said that OHA is a state agency. So it, it is bound by those open records laws. Now, the state legislature uh, a few years ago established this Native Hawaiian Roles Commission, the Kana'i Oluwalu. Yes. Um, it is a state agency, and they have commissioners that are appointed by the state, and they directed, the legislature directed that their funds would be paid for out of OHA's funds, which are also state funds. So here you have a state agency undertaking an activity that is signing up Hawaiians uh, in the Native Hawaiian role uh, that has been directed by the legislature to take place. So. That, that's that's uh, the first step, is they are a state agency, and they're doing a state function. So what we're involved in doing is holding a state agency accountable to the people. And, we, and we want them to be bringing accountable. Bringing the, the laws of the Sunshine Laws to bear upon them. Exactly. Now, it's not always been easy. Uh, we use something called the Freedom of Information Act right. in order to obtain information. Right. And sometimes we've been given some less than encouraging responses in, in the search for that information, but ultimately we've appealed to the Office of Information Practices in some cases, and, and we get information. Mm -hmm. uh, recently, uh, we were able to obtain the check register from the inception of the Native Hawaiian role and until the present day, and the ledger of their expenses. What did you think when you, you got a hold of those and, and took a look at them? Well, I don't know how those funds, and we're talking about $4 million worth of funds, and they've spent over three million of it. Uh, of the three million, they've spent about a quarter of a million dollars signing up Hawaiians. Okay, that's the role itself. That's the role. So the rest of it has gone to all kinds of, of things that aren't directly related to the roles. And for example, there are two vendors that received over $800,000 
from this, this fund, these state funds that came from OHA. One was a kind of a, a video company and another was a branding company. But, but my point is um, 800, over 800,000 went to two vendors. And as far as I can tell, um, there wasn't any public bidding for those contracts. Now, and that's another law. We have, we have another law, which is very much like the open records law. And that's the public bidding law. And why do we have public bidding requirements? For the same reason we have open government requirements, that we want things done above board. We want it done fairly. We want it done, but done a, a public contract for a fair price. And we want everyone in the public to have a fair opportunity to bid on the contract. But if it turns out that these two contracts were just given to two vendors without public bidding, then it's the very type of thing that the public bidding law, just like the public records law, is designed to prevent. Well, Michael, you're a former government official, and, yeah. and you, you were able to look into government in unique ways as attorney general. Is, is this potential violation of procurement laws something new that was just invented? or? <laughs> Why do we have how, both? How, how common is that here in Hawaii? Every law is an outgrowth of some problem that the legislature is trying to solve. And in the case of public bidding, it's to do exactly what I just said, was to give everybody a fair opportunity mm -hmm. uh, to be a part of uh, a process of bidding contracts, government contracts, uh, and that those contracts be open so everybody knows what's going on and not done behind closed doors. Um, same thing with the, the open records law. We want government to be transparent and accountable to the people. It's a government of the people, by the people. And the only way you're able to ensure that government is acting appropriately is to have the open records law. So it's just the same, it's the same idea as the public bidding law. Right, and, and, and so, one, we've asked for the, the role, um, that as it exists at any time, we've asked for the role, um, because we know that when the, when the Native Hawaiian uh, Roles Commission went out and signed up Hawaiians, uh, Native Hawaiians, that they only wound up with something like 25, 20,000. Right, Th their goal was based upon the census figure that there are about 500,000 Native Hawaiians nationwide. And the Native Hawaiian role felt that if they could get 250,000 signed up, that would be a good representation right. of, of a movement, of a nation, actually. Right. They only got close to 25,000, which would be 5% of the total. Right. Then they did something that, that you find particularly disturbing. And what, what did they do to, to fill their numbers well, when the, they were as low as 25,000? I guess to make it look like it's a more legitimate list so that you don't have a small number, they just take other lists that OHA had. That's right. And transfer it over and say, these names that never signed up to be a part of the commission role is now part of the commission role. Now, my mother told me about one of those lists. She said, I just signed up for the Kaui Noah because I would get a red t-shirt and an ID card because I'm proud to be Hawaiian. Yeah. But she doesn't want to have anything to do with being on the Native Hawaiian role because She's proud to be Hawaiian, but she's also proud to be an American and, and doesn't want to be part of, a, of anything that might separate her from her American citizenship or establish a separate sovereignty. Now, there are, several, there are other people we've heard who feel the same way. That's what I've heard. And, it, and the idea of the Ropens Record Law, why we're asking for mm -hmm. this list, is just to shine the light of day onto it. That's right. So that everybody can look at it and see, is this right? Is this correct? Is this fair? Is this what the legislature intended? The legislature expected the commission to go out and sign up voters, and they did. But because apparently because they couldn't sign up enough, they want to pad the, the numbers by these other lists that didn't sign up for them. Well, you know, that could be particularly egregious for, for somebody who doesn't agree with the philosophy of the Native Hawaiian role. You know, when you go to the website to sign up for Kana'i Olovalu, the Native Hawaiian role, you have to affirm a statement at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And it starts, I affirm the unrelinquished sovereignty of the Hawaiian people. Now, that's a political statement, isn't it? it, it it's not the same as saying, I'm proud to be Hawaiian, and uh, 
I'd like to affiliate with OHA. And some people have taken exception to that. Some people have even used the, the, the statement identity theft. That's what they've felt has happened when their name was taken from one list and put onto another. I guess. That, that I at least guess. speaks to how deeply they feel about that. Well, it's, it's certainly a, a, a much different thing to, to swear fealty to something and just be on the list. Yes. That, that's two different things. That's right. And, and so the participation in the Native Hawaiian role is something that, that, that is far more uh, well, let's put it this way, substantive in one sense in terms of s swearing towards something than simply signing up and saying, I I'd like to have my name on a list of Hawaiians. Now, <laughs> I think that it, 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 it would serve us well to point out in our efforts to help government be more transparent and open, we have nothing against Native Hawaiians. We have nothing against anyone in particular. In fact, it, it is to the benefit of Native Hawaiians and all citizens that agencies like the Native Hawaiian role be kept accountable. Well, we, we, I would think everybody wants government of, of any nature to be accountable and open and not be done behind closed doors. So uh, why, why the mystery? Why, why, the, why, is thing, why are things being kept behind, sealed behind closed doors? Right. What, are, what are they afraid um, one of the things we ask for, I ask for, the Judicial Watch is my client, ask for is records regarding the reopening of the time period for the Kana'i Oluwalu during which they were transferring names from one, one, one list to another. Uh, records regarding that. They don't want to show, they don't want to, anything about opening up those records. Well, as you mentioned earlier, when the process is not transparent, the, the people have no way of looking in and seeing whether yeah. the process is proper. If it's, if it's something that you feel strongly about and you think it's the right thing to do, you should be proud of it and you'd want it proclaimed the top of Mauna Kea. As well, that's an interesting yeah. topic. But you Maybe. know what I mean? <laughs> yes, if, if you're involved in something important yes. and you think it's a worthy cause, uh, you should be proud of it and you should want to open it up and, and not be ashamed of it or hide it or, you know, just be totally free and open with it. That's, to me, that's the right way to go. Well, Michael, when we come back from a break, we'll let you talk about what could be shouted from the top of Mount Kea <laughs> of all places. <laughs> We've been talking about the importance of transparency and the efforts of Grassroot Institute and Michael Lilly. Uh, to hold government agents transparent. One of the things we've been able to do is get information that people can look at, and the Grassroot Institute of Hawaii has put that onto a website called openhawaii.org. That's openhawaii.org. There you'll find the check register for the Native Hawaiian Roll Commission, the ledger of their expenses. You'll also find the letters that Michael Lilly has sent to the State uh, Department uh, leaders uh, requesting that they take a look at some of the procurement practices uh, that, that may have been uh, possibly violated uh, in uh, the, the expenditures of the Native Hawaiian role. You'll find that and much more information at openhawaii.org. This is Kili'i Akina with Michael Lilly. Uh, don't go away because you're going to be fascinated by what Mr. Lilly has to say about some interesting subjects. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, Check us out every Thursday. Hi, I'm your host on Think Tech Asia, Bill Sharp. I look forward to, to you joining us each Monday between 4 and 5 o'clock uh, when we film right here in our studio in downtown Honolulu. The show, Think Tech Asia, focuses on contemporary events in Asia. And by Asia, we mean anything from Hawaii, south to Australia and New Zealand, well, west to Pakistan, and as far north as the Russian Far East. Clearly, this is one of the most economically dynamic centers of the world. Uh, and we bring you up to date on what's going on in a whole host of countries in this very vital region. We look forward to seeing you. Aloha.
This is Alex Lee Hagen, host of Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. My show here at Think Tech Hawaii is every Thursday from 3 to 4 in the afternoon. I bring in interesting guests from Hawaii, the mainland, and hopefully international guests in the future. Do join us on Thursday from 3 to 4 p.m. Think Tech Hawaii Business Education Spotlight. Aloha. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako. We're here every week on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako is based upon a venerable Hawaiian saying, e pule kako, which means let's pray together. So at the Grassroot Institute, we say let's work together. Let's work together to build a better government, a better economy, a better society. Think of the alternative, not working together, then we get nothing done. Uh, I'm delighted that today I get to talk with a good friend of mine, Michael Lilly, who has a, a deep understanding of the law in Hawaii and its equitable application to all people, whether Hawaiian or, or otherwise, because we are all citizens equal under the law. Before we return to our, our discussion, I, I want to remind you of a program we did uh, a, a few months ago. Um, the chief executive officer of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs did something that took national and international uh, attention, and that is he wrote a letter without the permission of the trustees to the Secretary of State of the United States. And in this letter, he states basically that Hawaii has been under a prolonged and illegal occupation and that there are questions about sovereignty over Hawaii. Uh, and so he's asked, he actually asked in the letter the Secretary of State of the United States two questions. First of all, whether the state of Hawaii has jurisdiction here in the Hawaiian Islands legally. And secondly, whether the United States has jurisdiction. He made an interesting comment in the letter in which he said he could not go to the state attorney general because the state attorney general of Hawaii would have a conflict of interest in answering that question. Now, whether one ridicules the letter or takes it seriously, it, it raises an issue that really uh, should be a non-issue in Hawaii, and that is, are the Hawaiians, native Hawaiians, exempt from the laws that all people are under? Michael Lilly earlier pointed out that the state agencies that deal with native Hawaiians, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, and the commission known as the Native Hawaiian Role Commission, are not exempt. That these are government-funded, government agencies of the people, by the people, and for the people, and they need to be held accountable. I'm going to dive right back into the co this conversation. I'm not going to ask Michael what he thinks about the letter, <laughs> but I, I do, do want to talk a, a little bit, Michael, uh, about something going on uh, with respect to the law. Currently, we're observing some individuals on Mauna Kea uh, who are protesting the building of the TMT, the 30-meter telescope, a project that has been approved by the state government, by the people of Hawaii, that has been vetted for a fairly long time. But they are protesting, and they are also blocking the road, committing a crime. What are your thoughts about this with respect to the, the importance of the rule of law? Well, first of all, I'm sensitive to uh, the Hawaiian cultural connection to Mauna Kea, uh, and their right to protest. Yes. That's deeply ingrained in our culture, that you have a right to express yourself, and so I, I support that. And it's their First Amendment right, the constitutional right. Absolutely, and right, right to assemble. Um, and we need to preserve that. Those are constitutional rights. I might add one other thing, too. It's not only the, the right to speak and to assemble, but to exercise one's own religion, as they are claiming to be doing as and, well. And to petition government. Yes. Those are constitutional rights. Uh, but uh, the reason those uh, number of them were arrested were they were impeding lawful travel to the top of that mountain. And this issue is not one that's new. Uh, it was one that's been vetted for a long time. This, this uh, project has been uh, on the books for years. They've gone through every single kind of um, review possible. They went through an environmental uh, impact review when anyone who had an issue, whether it's uh, environmental, cultural, um, legal, any issue with re regard to the development up there at the top. Uh, people had an opportunity to participate in that, to uh, voice their opinions, uh, and that was done. And when it was all said and done, and the contracts were led, the, let the permits were issued, and, and the 
construction went forward. In fact, and, and I, yes, I tell you what, I, I, I heard this. Uh, you know, the Hawaiians a thousand years ago uh, were the greatest navigators in the world. Mm -hmm. They inhabited every inhabitable Polynesian island uh, at a time when people, <laughs> Western civilization were crashing ships on rocks. Uh, not very good navigators, but the, na they were great navigators. And we sent out the Hokulea to show how you could use those skills to navigate to other islands, even today. And, and I see that 30-meter telescope as, as a great opportunity for Hawaii and Hawaiians uh, to help navigate to the stars and other planets, because this, that's, this uh, telescope is going to be expanding our understanding of the universe which to me is very Hawaiian. Absolutely. I'm glad you put it that way. In fact, you mentioned the Hokulea. The pilot of the Hokulea navigator, Nainoa Thompson, actually did his training in the Bishop Museum Planetarium using the latest technology in order to learn how to navigate the stars. And, and so there's nothing un-Hawaiian. In fact, one of the, th the things I want to be careful about is this. Sometimes because of the way the news media frames the, the protests that are taking place, generalizations are used, that these are Hawaiian protesters, as if they represented the Hawaiian people. Uh, that's a, a very broad statement, the Hawaiian people, those who are Hawaiian by blood, those who are Hawaiian by heart. Um, it, and we have to be careful not to say that any one group of people, not to say that I, not to say that a, a government agency, and not to say that a group of protesters actually represent all of the Hawaiian voices. Well, there, there was an agency that to some extent uh, represented some interests of Hawaiians, the and that's Office, Office of, of Hawaiian Ho Affairs. OHA. Uh, OHA approved this project and will receive a percentage of the rent of this project uh, up until the time that you get these latter-day protesters and suddenly uh, you know, people start jumping on a bandwagon. Uh, but but there was a lot of support for this project. Well, a good number of viewers that, are, that we have here on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network are global. Uh, th this program is one of several, about 35 hours of original content that is produced here mm -hmm. weekly that goes across the world. And, and I'd like to clarify for them that, that what they're observing in global media now uh, whether it be Twitter or whether it be the National Enquirer or, or, or um, the, the um, statements by many celebrities, it, it's not really what is representative of the vast majority of people who would call themselves Hawaiian, whether by blood or whether by heart. Uh, but they do have the right to protest, and that, yeah. but not to break the law. No, I, I was happy to see those folks at the University of Hawaii with their pohaku. And, uh, I, I think that's great. But uh, this, is, this is a project that I think is going to go forward as it should. And I think it's something that Hawaii and Hawaiians should be really proud of, that we're at the vanguard of this type of science in, in, uh, in the universe. Well, there are so many good things for Hawaii that, that get started but somehow get truncated. In fact, uh, you're in a unique position because you, 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 were, you had a, a, a look into what went on with the stopping of a project earlier, the Super Ferry. Uh, a good deal of investment came to Hawaii. The state put up investment and so forth. Yeah. It solved a very real need, inter-island transport at an, an affordable price. And, and yet, um, we're left with egg on our face. I, I, I have to tell you that, that uh, when I was recently in Hong Kong talking to some businessmen, they actually raised that as the story of what investment is like in Hawaii. So we got very hurt by losing the super ferry project. Now, I don't think w we can or should lose the TMT, but, but what are the stakes here in terms of Hawaii's reputation as an investment climate? It, we have a terrible reputation. We, we have probably the worst reputation of any place in America for business. It's, I mean, it's, it's terrible that we, that we would uh, intentionally destroy something great. You know, the Hawaiians uh, develop fish ponds. Yes. And they have many different kinds of fish ponds. One of my clients has the Umeiki fish pond, and it's in a unique kind of structure that was able to farm the sea, go out into the sea. This is a scientific advancement that the Hawaiians did over a thousand years ago. So they were vanguards of science 
and they should uh, they should be the same uh, view toward this uh, telescope at the top of Mauna Kea that that we're advancing science and we're doing it here out here in the Pacific and we can be the beacons to the world to show how you can do something better that's right you know the the, the very sentiments that you you are um, speaking were, were were spoken by one of the astronomers uh, a native Hawaiian who is a prof who is a professional astronomer who went on to the news just last week and said virtually the same thing that, that he sees his work as a professional astronomer as consistent with his Hawaiian values and that he gets to fulfill that there at Mauna Kea and, and he's not in favor of obstructing the construction he's very much in favor of the TMT going forward well as I say these all of these people had an opportunity to speak uh, and apparently they didn't and now they've maybe it's become the protest du jour uh, that people are now latching on to this because there's so much interest in it. But uh, to me, it's something that, that we really should be proud of. Do you sense, Michael, that there's a, a, a trepidation? To, uh, there, there's a little caution exercised by everyone from the media to government to the public to stand up and, and, and object to the breaking of law in this case. That somehow, because being Hawaiian is invoked here, uh, that this group that's protesting is somehow getting a pass that others might not get? Uh, maybe, I don't know. That, uh, that could, could be an issue. Uh, I, feel, I feel badly if that's the case. Well, I, I think that often we don't know how to think about uh, the issues when Native Hawaiians are involved because we may, as a general public, be conflicted in our feelings about the past. Uh, oftentimes there's not good information about uh, the, the role of the United States, the role of Christianity, the, the role of those who've come from outside of Hawaii. And, and, and very often people are, feel somewhat apologetic at times. I don't know where these protesters are coming from. Mm -hmm. And I don't even know who they are. I know a lot of them say they're Hawaiian, but I, I don't, you don't know who they are. I don't know who they are. They're not, there's nobody I know of. Uh, but I talked about uh, the Hawaiians being vanguards of science. Look at Kalakaua. Yes. The, the, well, he had Edison here to light he, up the Iolani Palace. He electrified first... Iolani Palace before the White House. That's right. He embraced all kinds of advancements in science. He, he, was, he, went, he, went, he went around the world to bring science and advancement here. That's really, to me, is the heart of Hawaiians, is well, to be open at, to all kinds of new ways of doing things and, and other people. Isn't that the Aloha spirit? Absolutely. Are we showing that mm. on Mauna Kea? When we come back from a break, I, I'm going to ask uh, you to share just a little with our audience a, a, about your own family's heritage here in Hawaii. You're a long-term Kama'aina family. <laughs> uh, know what it is to be part of the Hawaiian culture. W we're talking about some very sensitive issues, and when we return in our final segment, we'll wrap up with Michael Lilly. I, I do want to say thank you to Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network, to Jay Fidel, the producer, and to all of the volunteers and staff who enable us to, to produce quality conversation that goes across the world. We'll be right back for our concluding segment today after this short message. Don't go away. Aloha, my name is Paul Jackson, better known as PJ. I know it. And my local interest is in sports. I have my own sports radio show at KWAI AM 1080 that you can stream live. I also have my own website, pjsportsradio.com. We have live guests in studio, and we talk about discussions and topics that everyone wants to know locally here on the island. We cover everything from surfing to basketball to whatever's going on locally, sports-wise. We try to do our best and cover the topics in, in depth as much as we can. Once again, thank you for joining PJ here on Hawaii Sports Update. Mahalo. Hi, aloha. My name is Chris Leesom, and I have host a show called The Economy and You. Uh, the show plays every Wednesday at noon, and on my show, I bring on guests who are interested or working in the technology space, and uh, so I'd like you to come and watch the show and learn with me about all the sort of exciting things that we're doing in Hawaii to build and grow our economy ecosystem. So I'd like to say aloha, and I look forward to seeing you on the show. Thank you. Aloha. Welcome back to our final segment of Ehana Kako. Uh, today's issues, I hope, uh, 
have been clarified somewhat because it's often difficult to talk about and understand what's going on with the Native Hawaiian issues. Uh, there's so many different players and probably no one person or one organization represents everyone. The Grassroot Institute has been active in trying to hold government accountable and of course part of that government is the Native Hawaiian Role Commission and the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and so we're grateful for the efforts of Judicial Watch and for Michael Lilly, former Attorney General. Uh, we're going to wrap up a little bit here uh, with a little hodgepodge of, of, of issues that are somewhat related. Michael, your family uh, has been here in Hawaii for quite a while. Since when? 1840s. 1840s. My goodness. Uh, who were some of the luminaries since that time? Well, my grandfather's father was a minister of finance and attorney general of the Kalakaua. There you go. So you're in his footsteps. And, Can you imagine that? A hundred years and a, later. And a confidant of Queen Leo Kalani. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that broke it to her that the Committee of Public Safety that he opposed uh -huh. um, hey. demanded her abdication. And you often hear that the Hawaiian Revolution was bloodless. But the Queen uh, met with my great grandmother in May of that year to give her her condolences at the death of her husband at the hands of the revolutionaries. Uh. That he was one of many, this is according to the Queen's book, who perished by the revolutionaries. So and my grandfather always, I, I remember saying to my grandfather, who was born here in 1885, I said, I said, Gramps, what is a Hawaiian? And he said, I'm a Hawaiian. And they were Scottish, I mean, the Scottish background. <laughs> Scottish Hawaiian. Scottish Hawaiian. <laughs> well, and that is an important question. What, what is a, a Hawaiian? Uh, I like your talking about Hawaiian and heart, mm -hmm. because that, that's the way, well, my, uh, Gramps was a, Hawaiian, a citizen of the Hawaiian monarchy, mm -hmm. and, and I have his grandfather's um, citizenship papers where he, you talked about fealty to, Yes, uh, you know, fealty to the Hawaiian sovereignty of the nation. That's right. Uh, that's what he did. He he pledged his fealty to the crown. There the were a, a good many people who may not have had Hawaiian blood yeah, he was, genetically. And he was pure Scot, but they were full citizens. He was a hundred percent citizen. They they were so, supportive of the the queen and yeah. so forth. And your ancestors are among them. Well, see, so I I think uh, if not in blood, they were they were Hawaiian in heart. Well, if, if ever, uh, as uh, at one point uh, our legislature was talking about uh, taking the ceded lands and giving them back to individual Hawaiians, uh, you'd probably stand to inherit some of that. <laughs> I, I don't know how, they, how, how you parse that, because yes. uh, the, the Hawaiian monarchy, and it's just my opinion, and it's, uh, it was multicultural, uh, multi-ethnic. It, it, it uh, took all comers. Uh, it opened, as the Aloha Spirit, they opened arms to everything, and you never excluded anybody. Everybody was part of the Calabash. That's right. Now, fast forward to the issue that you and I are dealing with, the Native Hawaiian role. It, it's ironic. The, the, the rationale, the need for a formal role process to use a computer to sign up names to create a list of Hawaiian citizens exists because... Hawaiians w were not some a single ethnic or racial enclave of people. W we were so open and have always been so open to intermarrying that we're dispersed and scattered across the nation. 500,000 part Hawaiians across the nation who are mostly something else also. Well, the Supreme Court said clearly in Rice v. Caetano there never was a Hawaiian tribe. Right. And you saw what happened when the Department of Interior came out here and for hearings, you heard the Hawaiians say loud and clear, we're not Indians, we're not a tribe. And this Hawaiian, uh, this is just my opinion, the Native Hawaiian Rolls Commission was established uh, by the state legislature to sign up only an ethnic, um, an, a, 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 an ethnic minority. And that's not constitutional. And, and the Hawaiians that, are, that I've talked to that are opposed to the Native Hawaiian Rules Commission, they feel if there is to be a, uh, a Hawaiian nation or some kind of sovereignty thing, it's something at a much higher level. Mm -hmm. it's, it's between 
some Hawaiian nation and the United States as nation to nation, and not something that's established by um, the state of Le Hawaii legislature. The state of Hawaii legislature has no constitutional power to be doing what they're doing, and I suppose at some point that, that will be tested. M Michael, how did it happen that the state of Hawaii's legislature in 2012 passed a law, and the governor signed it, that said that the state shall establish this sovereign nation. Be because for 20 years, mm -hmm. uh, an effort to try and pass the Akaka Bill in the U.S. Right. Congress was unsuccessful, failed, uh, and tens of billions of dollars of Hawaiian trust funds were squandered on that effort, in my opinion. Right. Uh, when that failed, okay, well, let's, instead of having something at the national level, let's have the state do it. But here we have the Supreme Court, which you cited earlier in the Rice v. Cayetano case, saying, no, this isn't going to happen. You have Congress uh, turning down the Akaka bill all the way through its run for about 15 years. So we've got the Supreme Court. We've got Congress. Now the state of Hawaii takes up the gauntlet and, and says, we will, will by fiat establish this sovereign entity. Uh, where's the Constitution uh, in that? Well, How could that happen in, in, in a, well, our moder modern government uh, affair? Under the Constitution, you can't set up that's uh, right. something that's just of an ethnic minority. You can't do that. Uh, and, then, so that's and then the idea of the Rules Commission is... Would that be the 14th Amendment? 14th Amendment, then, right. then, you, then you are you're creating a rule mm -hmm. that's now going to vo vote on some kind of a Congress. Okay, so we're in the 15th Amendment, we've got to, an electorate. To create some entity, but you have to be ethnic Hawaiian to vote there. So you now you that's a right to vote Well, I guess the issue. question I'm that's asking, right, that's, that's right. That's, that's what happened Voters with Rice v. Right. Caetano. Uh, the Supreme Court said you could not limit the vote for trustees of OHA to only ethnic Hawaiians, you had to open it up to everybody under the Constitution. Right. So the question I'm really asking is, why didn't some legislator stand up? Maybe there was one. <laughs> Probably <laughs> one. <laughs> one in the Senate. But why didn't some legislator stand up and say, this is against the Constitution of the United States? Why didn't the Attorney General advising the governor when he had, was about to sign this stand up and say, this is against the Constitution of the United States. I don't you know. were out of office already. Hey, <laughs> legislatures do wrong things all the time. And this is, this is, in my opinion, is not a good law. What do you think the prospects are for getting this turned around on constitutional grounds? Very high. Very high. Well, for, for one thing, how can you have a vote that will run right against Rice, Rice v. Caetano? So there's a Supreme Court ruling already that, that, that would be violated on top of the Constitution exactly. of the United States. And first, I'm, first you've established mm -hmm. it. That's, that's a race base. And then you're going to have a vote that's uh, against the Rice v. Caetano prohibition. Well, wouldn't you think that the, the, the state of Hawaii, the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, the smart people at the Native Hawaiian Role Commission, which is chaired by a, a former lawyer and governor, of a lawyer and former governor, wouldn't you think they'd, they'd know that this thing will, will fall before the Supreme Court someday? You think so? What do you think they'd have to, get, they, they have to gain in the meantime? Another form of land and power? Land and power, yes. Randy Ross' book and the story of the Bishop Estate. Do you, do you think we're seeing some of that being played out as a, a game plan or a, 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 once again, land and power? That's what I see, but... Mm -hmm. um, I know I I know a lot of Hawaiian families that are impoverished that uh, need educational funds, mm -hmm. uh, and then I see funds that could go to that effort being squandered. Absolutely. I mean, the eight hundred thousand I talked about that that was on two vendors uh, at the Native Hawaiian Rules Commission. How many Native Hawaiian children could that have educated? And those were only two items that you were pointing out in, in a list oh, we're talking of about three, over, over 600 checks that we went through. We're talking about over six, uh, $3 million yes. uh, on, a, on what I think is going to ultimately be a failed effort. Could educate how many Hawaiian yeah. children? I, I think on one hand, uh, we are grieved because the Constitution is being trampled. 
the 14th and 15th yeah. Amendments. And, and that, in and of itself, is, is, is a, a, a deep problem for Hawaii. But on the other hand, or at the same time, at the same time, needy Hawaiians who have need of housing, of health care, of education, of jobs, and so forth, are going without because of the amount of money, the millions of dollars and tens of millions that have gone ultimately to the Akaka Bill and the Native Hawaiian Roll effort over the last many years. I've seen quotes from OHA saying they're running out of money. They're squandering their, their, their trust funds. But they're, they're not squandering it on education mm -hmm. and housing and clothing and benefiting Hawaiian children. Well, a good deal of this money is going for what would have to be called a political cause. Yeah. And this political cause of starting a sovereign nation that is unconstitutional, it deprives Hawaiians of all people of, of something that, that should be a benefit to them, the trust funds. Yeah. Michael, I want to thank you for your time today uh, and also for your, your, your efforts. Uh, the, the, the care and the sensitivity you have toward what others feel is sacred is, is very evident, and I appreciate that greatly. But of course, the, there is the importance of the rule of law. I'm wondering mm -hmm. if, in closing, you could address that. Well, what it means that the law must be equitably administered over all people, that, w that we really have to be a, a land of law. Isn't that the legacy of, Kalika, of uh, Kamehameha? Absolutely. Isn't that what Kamehameha taught us, well, is, is for equitable treatment among all people? And then when we established a monarchy in the 1800s, it was equal justice for all. That's the 1840 Constitution by Kamehameha yeah. III. And all the constitutions recognize the, uh, the, the freedom of all citizens in, to, without any kind of discrimination, the kind of things we're talking about in America. That, that to me, is the heart of the Hawaiian nation. Ultimately, when we are trying to hold government accountable and stand for the equitable practice of law over all people, we're doing something very Hawaiian, something that yeah. is very much in spirit with the progress of the Hawaiian nation in the 19th century. I asked uh, Kekuni Blaisdell one time, because he's he's strong sovereignty advocate, and I said, what kind of a sovereignty do you envision? And he said, one that embraces all people. Well, there you have it. Yeah. And that, Isn't that what we have? That's aloha kekahi kekahi. Yeah. Let us have yeah. love for one another, for yeah. all people. Michael, always good talking yes, with you. Yes, Appreciate it very much. My guest today is Michael Lilly, former Attorney General of the State of Hawaii, uh, a man deeply steeped in the knowledge of uh, Hawaiian history and, and law, somebody who has been a, a public servant who today we are grateful is working with the Grassroot Institute in our efforts to hold government agencies accountable and transparent, particularly in this case, the Native Hawaiian role. I'd like to encourage you to take a look at some of the documents that we talk about today. One of the things we want to do at the Grassroot Institute is to provide information that journalists, that uh, citizens, that government leaders can can actually uh, use. And so with respect to uh, the Native Hawaiian issues, we have uh, pursued information through Freedom of Information Act requests, through, through appeals at the Office of Information Practice, and even through the courts, uh, in order to make that available to the public. You can access all of this at grassroots openhawaii.org website, openhawaii.org. And you'll also find a couple of letters by Michael Lilly uh, asking some of our departments of government to hold the Native Hawaiian Role Commission accountable. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. Until next week on Ehana Kako, aloha. So what is